The economic crash began at home, quite literally. As the bottom fell out of the U.S. housing market in late 2007, the aftershock quickly hit worldwide. I don't know if we carry most of the blame on our shoulders in terms of the global meltdown, but we sure have our share of it. Global markets lost confidence in the securitized mortgage industry that had driven the U.S. and global economy for nearly a decade. And by late 2008, lending came to a screeching halt. Banks and other financial institutions once seen as indestructible collapsed. The stock market dropped to its lowest level in decades. We live in an increasingly integrated international economy. And so what you see are the interconnections either in a spiral down or hopefully a spiral back. How has the global financial crisis hit markets worldwide? And what can be done to prevent it from happening again? Next on Great Decisions. In a democracy, agreement is not essential, but participation is. Join us as we discuss today's most critical global issues. Join us for Great Decisions. Great Decisions is produced by the Foreign Policy Association, inspiring Americans to learn more about the world. Funding for Great Decisions is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York, the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. And now from our studios, here is Ralph Begleiter. Welcome to Great Decisions. I'm Ralph Begleiter. Joining us to discuss the global impact of the financial crisis are Roger Kubarek, Senior Fellow for International Economics and Finance at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Mark Calabria, Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute in Washington. Gentlemen, after the Great Depression, I think all of us had the idea that systems were put in place, safety net in place, don't worry about this, it can't possibly happen again. Uh, we, we learned our lessons in the 1930s. Uh, and yet, um, were those assurances, if you will, false? Were we being deceived? Or have the markets outgrown or become more sophisticated than those regulations could handle? Well, Ralph, we had several very serious banking system crises just in the last 30 years. Uh, some of the more familiar ones was the uh, collapse of the, uh, the emerging markets uh, in the 1980s in from Asia, overborrowing. Yeah. Then we had the collapse in commercial real estate lending in the United States, Canary Wharf in London, the Swedish banks went bankrupt, and so on and so forth. Uh, around the late 80s and the early 90s, the thrift crisis in the United States, thousands of banks and thrifts went bankrupt. Uh, then we had the Asian crisis in 1997, 1998, that spread to Russia and really embroiled all of the emerging markets. Then we had the collapse of the high-tech bubble. So we have had repeated financial crises. The financial supervisory and regulatory system failed in each case. So we had plenty of warning. Plenty of warning, plenty of practice, get digging out of these various crises. This one was uh, bigger, uh, more rapid, more global. Mark, what about you? Should we have seen this coming? I think we should have, and, and I would agree with what a lot, of, a lot of what Roger just said. We have had several crises. This isn't the first. This might be one of the worst. Uh, but we seem to have a financial crisis every 5 to 10 to 15 years with pretty much regularity. You can almost bet on one. Uh, I think some of the issue is to the extent to which we misdiagnose what got us into the Great Depression. Uh, I think a lot of the things we set up actually exasperated the risk-taking to the extent that we thought we were safer, we therefore were willing to take more and more risk. Uh, and you saw that throughout the system. You saw that recently. Uh, I think the extent to which Greenspan, for instance, you know, the term the Greenspan put that came along, uh, there was a belief that if you got into too much trouble, you would be sort of bailed out. Roger, did we miss the signals? Did we ignore the signals? Was it purposeful that we ignored the signals? Some of it was purposeful. You know, we came out of the high-tech bubble. Uh, and uh, we had a big collapse in business investment. And the dollar uh, was uh, relatively uh, strong, and so imports were cheap. And exports were draggling, straggling, struggling. And so we had a big deficit. And basically, the best chance for getting out of that uh, economic slump was through housing. And so basically, all policies were designed to try to promote more home building, 
and more, uh, shall we say, activity in housing. And that included very cheap money by the Fed. It included regulatory uh, forbearance on what was happening in the mortgage market in terms of liar loans and subprime mortgages, uh, people getting big mortgages with zero down payment. These things didn't exist before. Uh, I think that, uh, I don't think it was purposeful in the sense that people knew what a catastrophe would happen, but they knew that they were going out to the edge in terms of uh, support for housing. And when we got a housing bubble that then collapsed, it had an enormous repercussion on finance. Great decision spoke with some other experts about this topic about what precipitated the crisis. Let's hear what they have to say. So I think um, one always looks for, was there a straw that broke the camel's back or that precipitated all of this? Clearly subprime was of an order of magnitude that it triggered any number of the, the dominoes following a different analogy of dominoes. That was a beginning point. But there, were a lot of, there was a lot of risk in the system around the world and different types of risk, not just an American-made risk profile. We didn't uh, regulate properly. Uh, as a matter of fact, we took some steps which took the cops off the beat when they should be on the beat when it comes to Wall Street and the financial institutions. Uh, we uh, said that these, uh, these uh, financial derivatives, so-called, would not be regulated. Uh, that created a situation where we basically um, have a gambling casino. I think we've all learned a lot of valuable lessons from what happened in the crisis. I think not the least of which was uh, the overall use of leverage in the system and the interconnectedness between the markets that that leverage really impacted. It began with a financial problem, it became a trade collapse, uh, and it became then a commodity price shift, uh, which hurt almost everybody. What might have started with uh, bad loans in the United States uh, means that you get a global slowdown, which starts to hurt the economy in the developing world, and then bad loans from a bad economy in poor countries will start to hurt the banks in developing countries, even though they didn't hold any U.S. mortgage debt. A, a lot of that sounds a bit anodyne, actually, as, as if there were machines operating somehow beyond our comprehension and out of our control and so on. Didn't people in some way contribute to this? Uh, Mark, what do you oh, think? Well, we, we, we all contributed to it uh, because the reality is the American public, the public everywhere loves a bubble when it's going on, and we never really want to admit that to ourselves. Uh, despite, you know, you talk about your neighbor and how much he got for his house and you knew in your heart it was unsustainable. Uh, but we reacted to those incentives, uh, and we've been there before. Uh, you had a number of years, about three years, where we had negative real federal funds rate my mind, you can't have an, uh, a situation where you're basically paying people to take money where you're not going to have problems later come from that. Uh, and you looked at the housing bubble, nine out of the last 10 recessions have probably had some sort of real estate element to it. So we've been there before. Uh, a lot of the same problems that got us in the trouble, the savings loan crisis were there before. You know, whether it was borrowing very, very short term and lending long, uh, you look at something like Bear. It's very hard in my mind to think that you'd look at an institution where you've got essentially 30-year mortgage-backed securities that you're largely funding overnight and forget the credit quality of the mortgages. You're going to implode at some point in my mind just because somebody's going to have a hiccup and you're going to get into trouble. So I think much of this was easily foreseeable uh, and we could have uh, done some things to go against it, but I do think that the politics of it, the popularity of it at the time, because there was so much uh, feeling to believe that this bubble was sustainable and that it wasn't a bubble and that, you know, we had found a new economy, that a new housing economy that could last forever and we could just expand home ownership and get everybody in the houses without a problem. You, you mentioned, Mark, uh, politics uh, briefly. We were in a transition in the last couple of years from one eight-year presidency to a new presidency. Everybody knew there was going to be a new president. It wasn't a case of re-election and so on. Did that play a role, the sense that Washington was not going to be at the switch for the next couple of years. They were going to be concerned with other things or not. What do you think? I, I don't think it really uh, played much of a role. Uh, you know, the, the you know, love of subsidies for housing is bipartisan. Uh, and there's certainly not a, a difference in that. And, and, and because of that, I do think uh, Roger's point about the buy side driving Wall Street. I mean, Wall Street will make a deal whoever wants as a buyer. And part of the pressure coming into the politics was really on, for instance, Freddie and Fannie. At the height of... Freddie May and Fannie uh, Mac. Fannie okay. May and Freddie Mac. At the height of the housing bubble, 
these two entities purchased 40% of the subprime mortgage-backed private label securities. They were the largest marginal buyer that was out there, uh, and they were doing this under considerable pressure to expand homeownership. Now, I do think there was a belief in Washington that you could simply expand homeownership and it would be sustainable. Um, I would maybe disagree a little bit with the extent to which I think a lot of people were defrauded or taken advantage of. There certainly was that. Uh, but if you look at, you know, the careful empirical studies have been done, the, the two things that drive it are you've had a life event like a job loss, and the subprime is really sort of the canary in the coal mine in that regard. If you've got subprime credit, you have a loose attachment to the labor market generally. And if you also look at it, very few people in the subprime market put equity down. So if you have this combination of you've lost your job and you have no equity to tap, I mean, you haven't necessarily been defrauded or ripped off, but you're in a bad situation and you're in a tough situation where you're likely to walk away. That's driven far more of the foreclosures, delinquencies, and subprime than I think fraud has. I don't think people realize how quickly this crisis emerged. Prior to 2002, there were hardly any subprime mortgages. There were almost no mortgages that were written where you could have 100% uh, leverage in the house. Uh, the traditional 15% down payment may have gotten uh, viewed as obsolete, but to have no down payment? Uh, all of this happened in a four-year period. Within, by, by 2006, more than 50% of all mortgages were written, that were written were subprime. And they were financing much more than the ordinary person buying a house. They were financing second and third home uh, purchasers who were doing it primarily on spec. Uh, about a third of these mortgages were financing houses that nobody lived in. They were just being held totally as a speculation. Where were the regulators during this process? They were aiding and abetting that process. You've both mentioned the international situation in your earlier remarks, but we've been concentrating largely on the domestic situation here. Let's turn to some of our other, other experts for a moment to see how global institutions responded to this crisis and what role they perhaps could play in, in fixing it the next time around. Let's listen. I do think that, um, you know, 2008 and 2009 may go down in the history books as sort of a triumph for economic policy making. And the fact that now we have green shoots, growth is coming back, it's not going to be a quick return to prosperity. Uh, but we've averted the worst, and I think that's a tribute uh, to the aggression with which policymakers responded. I think what we've seen that's a very positive outcome the last few months here is that people have gotten away from trying to blame, play the blame game, and people have spent more time trying to focus on how do we work our way out of this and how do we work together to figure out we're all in it together, who cares how we got here. We have adopted a major commitment to the International Monetary Fund. Uh, as part of our commitment, uh, we passed an amendment uh, which required that a significant portion of those funds go to poor countries. Uh, this global economic crisis has seen a significant increase in the number of poor people in the world uh, and a significant reduction in the amount of resources which are available uh, to help out in this kind of situation. You have to have a cooperative response, but it also has to recognize that you're going to have different stages of this crisis that you have to keep attacking. Now, we've been talking about the problem in the United States and now the global response to it. This was like a firecracker, though. It started, the fuse started in one place, and pretty soon the fuse was burning all over the world. Are we in a situation now where it's simply impossible for other countries to say, isolate themselves, say, we're out of here, we're not tied to, so closely to the U.S. market and so on? Uh, I think you're a little bit exaggerating the, uh, the nature of the global impact. Uh, European banks were uh, hit by this quite hard, by the uh, fallout from the, the uh, original uh, failure of Bear Stearns and other aspects of the subprime mortgage fallout. And there were uh, big failures. Uh, you had uh, Northern Rock in uh, the UK that had to be essentially nationalized. You had Hupo uh, Real Estate in uh, Germany, which was first nationalized and then liquidated, and on and on. Now, compare that to Asia. Now, clearly, uh, the Japanese banks, who had been uh, smarting from their past mistakes, were on the sidelines. They were not caught up in this. The Chinese institutions, were not entirely uh, uh, spared, but they didn't. That, that it was a glancing blow. What hit those countries? And as you know, Japan had a bigger recession in their manufacturing than we did. Is the impact on trade? Uh, 
And that happened because of this enormous reassessment by international business about their uh, need for uh, fixed investment and their ability to raise capital if they wanted to go ahead with fixed investment. We had a fixed investment crash, which led to a trade crash uh, that was partly uh, financially driven, but largely it had other origins that were global. Mark, did you want to comment on the globalization aspect? Well, there's a couple of elements that I think this are very important. And I think it is very difficult for other countries to divorce themselves from our monetary policy. Uh, you know, you, when, with what the dollar does, you almost have to react to. So if you really looked at leading up to the housing bubble, what the uh, Central European Central Bank was doing or the Bank of London was doing, they were forced to somewhat maintain loose monetary policy as well. If you look across the continent, there was actually housing bubbles in Spain and Ireland that were bigger in terms of the inflation of the bubble than the U.S. bubble. So this was something that was across the developed world. Now, a lot of the same forces were driving that. I mean, we talk a lot about how uh, excess savings from Asia flowed into America. Well, a lot of excess savings from Asia flowed into Spain and Ireland as well. So they had a lot of the same global imbalances we did. There were some exceptions. I mean, you had oil-producing countries like Norway where the exporters of capital rather than the importers. So they had a little different situation, but I think it's very difficult currently to divorce yourself from the dollar given the reserve currency of the world. Uh, so. I think that, to me, is one of the key things going forward, and that as long as we sort of set loose monetary policy that can set the groundwork for bubbles, a lot of other countries are going to have very difficulty uh, adjusting to that. i got to ask you about Duncan Niederauer's comment that we heard just a moment ago. He says, you know, get beyond the blame game. Who cares how we got here, I think is how he said it. Don't we have to care how we got here if we're going to prevent getting there again, or is that kind of a symptom of the problem, is that we just say, oh, that's what's past is past. Let's just move on and make more money. I Mark? I think the thing we need to parse out is what is the blame versus who is to blame. Uh, I think it's easy to sort of get into a mindset of, well, this person messed up, they're gone, and you just need to remove the bad people and the bad management from the system where you go forward. I think that would be a real mistake because if you don't fix the structural flaws and simply replace them with new people, you'll have these new people saying the same mistakes too. And that's not to minimize you know, the, uh, the fraud and abuses that did go on. You know, you don't want to, Madoff, clearly, in his example, was to blame. Uh, but someone, you know, I'm not sure how much I want to blame Frank Raines for the behavior of Fannie Mae. He certainly played a role, but to sort of just put another person in there and not fix the structure doesn't fix the problem. So we do need to be concerned about not getting too caught up in pointing fingers at individuals rather than structures. Well, historically, we've done a better job than we did this time. In the, uh, in the past, we've done better than exactly. we did now. The, in the collapse of the thrift industry, where I mentioned there were thousands of failures and uh, the FDIC uh, worked overtime and we had the Resolution Trust Company for government support to the whole sector. Over a thousand people were put in jail for various kinds of fraud. Uh, it is not uh, some historical new development to uh, look for criminality and uh, ascribe where that is appropriate and letting the court system work. I wouldn't want anybody to say we shouldn't pursue that. And certainly Madoff is the poster boy of the failure of the SEC to identify for nearly 20 years what he was up to. That's regulatory failure uh, on steroids. So there, I, I don't think that it's, uh, it, it's simply not uh, practical not to put blame because when there have been transgressions of that uh, magnitude, there's going to be uh, consequences. Let's uh, listen to some more of our uh, experts' comments now and kind of turn toward the future a bit and think about what might be put in place to prevent this sort of thing from happening again. Let's take a listen first. I think... Um, it is in the nature of capitalism to have booms and busts. But I think one of the lessons that the central banks are, have learned from this crisis is that you have a responsibility to deal with asset price inflation as well as goods inflation. I think the answer to having uh, enormous amounts of capital managed by enormous banks that are going to be bailed out by governments because you can't afford to let them go down, the answer is to have lots of smaller financial institutions they're going to take the risks instead of them. And those things are called hedge funds. I think there will be a lot of pressure on regulators to coordinate, to share information, and to recognize that if the markets are connected, the only way we're going to get there is by each regulator in its own country doing a great job in coordination with all the other regulators. There's no question, no one country can 
cure this dilemma or cure the problems, or for that matter, even as we move to new uh, regulation. Again, let's assume that when the world gets better and the economies are improving, active coordination and communication across governments and countries will be critical. Uh, we are dependent on one another. There's no breaking that aspect of our economy. So let's talk about lessons learned. Uh, let me ask you, Mark, first. Uh, where do we go from here? Are the things you could tick off for us that say, we've got to learn this lesson, that lesson, we've got to do this, that, or the other thing? I think the most important thing in my mind is the incentives we provide for leverage. If you look at any financial institution, you're talking 90 plus percent of their capital structure being debt. And if our approach to moral hazard, worrying about the incentives we provide is just on the equity side, then in my opinion, we're going to have no market discipline going forward. So you really do have to have that ability to come in where you have a credible mechanism to make creditors take losses when institutions are insolvent. Because to me, there's basically two pots of money. There's a the taxpayer and there are the debt holders. I would rather see the debt holders take those losses. I believe you need those debt holders to actually believe they'll take losses so that they'll monitor the institutions. So to me, that's number one, how do you impose haircuts on debt holders? Second, I think we really need to reevaluate our perspective on what we've done in monetary policy. Uh, I think the last 10 years, 20 years, the Fed has probably been one of the largest sources of volatility in the economy rather than a counterweight. So I think we do need to look at that in terms of how that inflates the bubbles. Um, there are a variety of other things I would look at as well. I mean, the credit rating agencies were mentioned earlier. They essentially, via regulation, have a de facto monopoly. I, I would end that essentially tomorrow. Uh, we need as a theme to figure out a way to increase the due diligence of investors, of consumers, and of regulators across the board. If there was anything lacking throughout this, everybody figured somebody else was on the job. So I think if there's one message I would hope people would take away is, nobody's watching your back. You need to watch your back going forward. Roger? Those are all very good ideas, and they're all on my list. But I would wrap it around with one important uh, addition, and that is we have to demand more of corporate governance, of the boards of directors of these institutions. And an idea that I have uh, put on the table and circulated with some of my former bosses is that we need to have a new class of board of director member, uh, call them expert directors. And they, they should be people with broad qualifications in the business of those institutions. It was staggering how few people on the boards of some of these institutions who failed had ever heard of a collateralized debt obligation, didn't know that their banks were running something called SIVs, structured investment vehicles, which got them, uh, several of them in big trouble, didn't know what the overall leverage was. We've got, to, we've got to correct that, not by completely abandoning the types of directors we already have, but augmenting them by people who really know the business. And they should be the ones uh, as chairing three committees, the Audit Committee, the Risk Management Committee, and the Compensation Committee of the Board, because we've got to start having compensation policies that take into consideration the risks that are being taken to make these fat profits in the good times. We need the kind of compensation that good hedge funds have. They have clawbacks in the bad times, the executives of the hedge fund giving back some of that money, and they have high water markets. High water marks means that if you uh, make a lot of profit and then you uh, incur a lot of losses, you don't get any bonuses until the profits exceed where you started from. Those are very positive steps forward. Let me ask you a, a final question and maybe a brief one if I could. Is there any role here for some kind of in new international institution or international collaboration of institutions uh, that can keep a perhaps more objective eye on what's going on in any region of the world? Roger? That is happening, and it has been endorsed and enshrined in Group of 20, the new the um, amalgam of presidents and prime ministers. Uh, at successive uh, economic summits. Mark, a final word? I'm generally very skeptical of having the international coordination. One, because if everybody's regulated the same way, they all react to shocks in the same way, and you actually can spread the propagation of, of uh, economic crisis that way. And I also look at the track record. Uh, Roger mentioned the capital standards. I think the Basel capital standards that was worked out in the international community had tons of flaws and was one of the contributors to the severity of the crisis we had. So, one, I don't think the track record is very good. 
And I would also say just as diversification is important in your own investment portfolio, I think diversification of approaches to regulation is important because we don't ahead of time know what the right regulatory scheme actually is. Mark Calabria, Director of Financial Regulation Studies at the Cato Institute in Washington, and Roger Kubarek, Adjunct Senior Fellow for Economics and Finance at the Council on Foreign Relations. Thank you both for being with us on Great Decisions. And thank you as well for joining us on Great Decisions this week. I'm Ralph Bigleiter. To learn more about topics discussed on Great Decisions, visit our website at greatdecisions.org. Great Decisions is available on DVD. To order, visit shoppbs.org or call 1-800-PLAY-PBS. Funding for Great Decisions in Foreign Policy is provided by the Carnegie Corporation of New York the Star Foundation, Shell International, and the European Commission. Great Decisions is produced in association with the University of Delaware. Next time on Great Decisions in Foreign Policy. An old favorite method of diplomacy, special envoys are back in vogue. President Obama has appointed special envoys to deal with everything from climate change to the closing of Guantanamo Bay. Will the Obama administration's reliance on these special negotiators advance U.S. goals in places like Afghanistan and the Middle East? Or are there too many cooks in the kitchen? Next time on Great Decisions in Foreign Policy.